Report! Humanoid prisoners have been captured and their machine has been secured. Excellent! Steady on. Oh, no, don't push her. Ow. Oh, really? With the time destructor under our command, conquest is assured. What? The time destructor? No, 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 no. Randomizer. But we have detected terranium from Uranus. Yes, well, I'd rather you kept that to yourselves, actually. But honestly, this isn't the Time Destructor, it's the Randomizer. I suppose you could use it to kill time in a sense, but it's not even... Silence! Explain the function of this machine! Speak! Oh, yes, sorry. Well, inside this machine is every Jerry Anderson television episode and feature film ever made, and... Anderson, I have no understanding of the word... Oh, I'll tell him you said that, and I think he'll be very hurt. You will explain the operation of this device? Well, it's very simple. Uh, uh, if one of you gentlemen would like to place your little sucker arm on the big red button there... Do, do you need a hand with that? I can do it! I can do it! Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's it. Now the machine is having a little think, and in a moment it'll print out a piece of paper telling us which episode of which series I'll be watching this week. There will be no watching this week. You will be exterminated. Oh, what a pity. However, today you would have been watching an episode of Stingray. Oh, that would have been nice. And it would have been Plant of Doom. Marina... When I say run, run. Right, run! Alert! Alert! Prisoners escaping! Alert! Alert! Prisoners have escaped! Prisoners have escaped! Alert! We have failed. Still, plant of doom. It sounds a most powerful weapon. We must seek, locate, and cultivate it. Seek, locate, cultivate. Seek. So after a long absence on the randomizer by uh, Stingray, we are back with episode 2, Plant of Doom, which was apparently broadcast in the UK as episode 34 originally, which makes this... My slave Marina has escaped! Rather silly, because it's like... It's taken Titan 33 weeks to realise that uh, Marina has escaped in that order. We're also uh, we're getting another look at... Uh, oh, great Teufel! Oh, fish god Teufel! To your face to Titan, leader of the underwater city of Titanica! Who only appeared in the... I think he, he disappeared after the Golden Sea in production order, so again, it doesn't make sense to bring him back. So late in the run. Even now, Marina is with the Akasid Terranians, Troy, Tempest, and his friends. Teufel was going to open his mouth, got a great big light coming out of it. You show me a blue coral flower, Great Teufel. But how can that help me? It's starting to smolder, and I'm not clear if, um, in this episode, characters are actually aware that the, the plant is smoldering. That exotic perfume, I have never known it before. It is intoxicating. I know, you know, clearly they can smell it, but um, they all seem unable to see the great wisps of vapor coming off the... The flower, it is consuming the atmosphere. It must be. I must destroy it. Titan put, puts things together very quickly, um, considering what we see later on in the episode from other characters. But he's uh, smashed the plant. I'm not sure how knocking it off the table is enough to uh, to negate its effects, but there we go. The mighty sea god has shown me the way. No, I was just trying to kill you. Is the answer. I'm bored in this tank. He's only got like three square feet to move in. Anyway, back at Marineville. Marina is very sad. And we don't like to see Marina very sad, do we? Say, Marina's crying. Atlantis, she's really crying. What are we going to do? Well, what can we do, Troy? She can't speak to tell us why she's upset. Maybe she doesn't like Marineville. Or dry land, come to that. Say, maybe she's homesick. How about it, Marina? Are you thinking about home? This is more stuff that makes no sense being put so late in the run, but... Um... Sure, we know it's on the bottom of the ocean, but exactly where? I get the, the impression that a lot of the, the earlier episodes were sort of thrown back later into the run. Um, 
kind of to to sort of bury certain bad episodes later in the run. And I don't think security ship has gone on a pleasure cruise. This really applies. Sure, it'll be a chance to meet Marina's people. We'll be exploring a new underwater city. Because as I remember it, this one's generally a good episode. Take care of HQ. Let's hope it satisfies Atlanta. Somehow I have my doubts. Also, I gather there was quite a lot of material shot for this one that doesn't make it to screen. This I, I once saw the script and the opening um, the opening lines of um, of direction gives this sort of really long journey of the camera towards Titanica, you know, going up mountains and down trenches and until you finally see this glorious city. And in the episode, it's just like, boom, there's Titanica. Um, which is not to say that, you know, shot of Titanica isn't, isn't impressive enough in itself. It's just like they looked at this script with this sort of movie quality level of direction in it and said, no, cut all that. We don't need it. And while the Stingray crews search for where Marina thinks her home might be, someone else's home on the island of Lemoy. Oh, I, I do love all this um, stuff in X20's house, the way everything flips round and, and flops over to reveal all his consoles and and such. Again, it's, it's stock footage almost every time, but it, it just looks so cool. Because it isn't immediately obvious that all that's there. X20 to Titan, come in, please. Titan to X20, what have you to report? The World Aquanaut Security Patrol vessel Stingray has been launched and is passing the island. I have learned that Stingray is bound for Pacifica in the domain of the traitorous marina, and she herself is aboard. Also, another thing that um, doesn't make much sense putting this so late in the original broadcast run is the characters changed. Uh, Quite a bit over the course of the run, and particularly Ray Barrett's voices for Commander Shaw and Titan. Um, they're not quite as we would recognise them yet. Um, Titan is much deeper than he would be in, in later episodes. And also, he and X20 have still got this... There's still a sort of credibility to their villainy at this point, whereas in later episodes they were... X20... They were played a bit more comedically. The underwater city of Marina's father, Aphony, and present him with this plant. When the cover is removed, its exotic perfume will consume the air, and Aphony and his guests from Stingray will die as they deserve. You will say you are from the underwater city of Kazuma. And Kazuma. Oh. Yeah, I, I also I'm not clear if this flower it's already approaching the that um, Titan's going to give to X20 to give to Marina, who will ultimately take it back to Marineville, is uh, the same one that tried to kill him earlier, or if they've got like multiple of these killer plants just hanging around Titanica. Um, clearly, nobody knew that it could poison anyone until until Teufel worked his magic on it. But um, there we go. X20 is off to. Uh, Pacifica, being escorted by one of these lovely little terrorfish. And I'm watching this in the uh, the HD, HD version that was on the Super Mario Nation box set. And it's... Um, you know, the terrorfish model, which I've never really appreciated much over the years, has got so much detail on it. X20 to escort vessel. It must be Stingray. Uh-oh. I love the way that Aquafibian just looks at the other one. Oh, no, we're dead. Uh, it, the interior set as well of the, the, the terrorfish is, is pretty nice as well. It sounds like one of those mechanical fish from Titanica, and there's another smaller craft with it. And this would also be the first appearance of uh, X20's ship. Stingray is approaching at speed. You must intercept Stingray at all costs. I will proceed to Aphony's domain. <laughs> Terrorfish is turning back while X20 goes on. And what I find interesting about this episode, and again, I, ha I hate to keep going back to the thing of it being put so late in the run originally, is um, for this episode and the very first episode, the Terrorfish is presented as this really genuinely dangerous threat to Stingray. Here we go, they're just sneaking up on them. <laughs> Any warning at all, almost. Dive, Roy, dive. Yeah, they only just avoided getting hit there, and yet, in 
you know, as time went on, the terrorfish, the aquafibians, became less of a threat to stingray. Um, I mean, there's... I, I want to say in, in Man from the Navy, they find a terrorfish, and they, they destroy it off-screen. It becomes... By the end of the series, the terrorfish is just like, you know, you can blow on it and it will explode. Here, it's like, oh my goodness, this is really dangerous. We are seriously under attack, and we've got to do everything we can to get away from these these really dangerous machines and the, the sort of cunning warriors who, who pilot them. And I... I kind of appreciate that it couldn't stay as dramatic as this for the entire series. Oh, and there's that gorgeous shot of Stingray leaping out of the water. Which I understand they um, they only did one take off. They were prepared to do quite a few to get that looking absolutely perfect, and yet they got it right first time. Um, I could be wrong on that, but, um, well, there we go. I've been wrong before. Right. Stand by to repel attack. So yeah, in the original broadcast run, it would make so little sense to put this so late on when we've got to this point of the terrorfish are just, you know, basically made of cardboard and you can, you know, you can kick them and they'll fall apart. And now it's like suddenly, oh my goodness, this is really, this is really serious stuff. But this battle is just so, so well directed. Green zero five. The pacing, especially the music and the voice acting, is just so on point. And there goes the terrorfish. When I was a kid, I had a friend who found the um, Ooh, hey, phones. the shot of the terrorfish, you know, being hit, but then f the the wreck floating away with its jaw flapping up and down. He thought that was the funniest thing he'd ever seen. He would watch that moment over and over on a loop just to see the the fish's um, jaw flapping. Anyway, we are now at Pacifica. Hafni, the peaceful one. Cultural lord of the oceans, great leader of the famed city of Pacifica. And guy who has a lot of books on his shelf behind the throne there. Oh, so many books. I come in peace to give you news of your daughter. As is the custom in my part of the underwater world, I bring you a rare and fragrant flower. It is a symbol of peace and an omen of good fortune. I have heard that you have suffered much since the evil Titan seized your daughter. And going back as well to how uh, how much more credible X20 and, and Titan are in early episodes, I do like how. Uh, I will not intrude on this happy reunion. How X20 seems almost like. Is Aphne. Almost genuinely concerned for Aphne's, Aphne's feelings, and it's like he, he's playing his part so well at this point. And that's it, he's left the flower behind. Heading home. X20 reporting to Titan. All is well. Your instructions have been carried out. He's also got fantastic hair and eyebrows, X20. The, the hair almost looked like it's um almost looked like it's it's made of feathers. I guess this is it. It's a building. An underwater skyscraper. Jumping catfish, what a place! And again, it, it's so weird watching the first episode of Stingray and they say you know, Phones is very sceptical of the idea of there being intelligent life underwater. And then suddenly, for 39 weeks after that, they can't stop finding cities and, and races that they never knew existed somehow before the series started. It's very strange. The water's being pumped out. Won't be long now, Marina, before we see your folks. You get the impression that they're in the airlock on the puppet stage where you can see all the, the bubbles and um, bits of seaweed and stuff floating past uh, the canopy window. It's, it's very impressive stuff. As is the set of, um, of Aphne's palace, really, this, this throne room. You don't get much of a sense of, like, a, a, a world, a city outside of this one room, but it's very impressive for what it is. I guess the old boy is her father, Phones. He sure is an impressive-looking guy. Yeah, Troy, but what's with all this arm waving? Because they're talking to each other. Maybe by thought transference. Well, it could just be sort of sign language, I suppose, but... Oh, they're so happy to see each other. I love Marina's smiling face. Got a feeling this is going to be quite a session. Oh, yeah. Lots of food on the table. There's fish and... Uh, sure is crustacean -y things and... Um, and this meal, it's delicious. Miscellaneous. This place is a cultural underwater city. Just look <laughs> at those statues. You know, Troy would say that about McDonald's. Someone just throws a load of food in him and it's like, wow, cultural city. It's beautiful. And they got that plant. He's saying something about the plant. Oh, that's it. Cover's coming off. And surprisingly, it's not going to do its thing straight away. Gee, that perfume's out of this world. 
At least a little bit of perfume, but not enough to overpower anybody. And Marina puts the uh, cover back on. Does Marina come back with us, or will she stay here with her father? I don't know, Phones. I kind of hope she might decide to become a permanent member of our crew. Hey, I've got dibs on her. Leave her alone. We wish to thank you on behalf of the World Aquanaut Security Patrol for the hospitality and friendship extended to us. Naturally, Marina, I would like you to come back with us and maybe help in the fight against the enemies of your people. But if you prefer to stay, there are no hard feelings. Do you understand? Oh, she understands, but she's very sad. And again, one of the things I love about wants to come back with us, why she'll follow Marina as a character. And we got back. Come on, skip on. And particularly the way she's presented in this episode, in this scene with her father, is because she can't speak. Everything she is has to be conveyed through the puppeteering, and the expression on the character's face. And I, I know there are some people out there who don't like her, but I think she's one of the. She's one of the great success stories in terms of characterization in the Super Mario Nation era because the, the people operating her have so little to work with and yet they manage to to get so much out of you know, out of shots like this, where it's just this long, slow pan towards her face and she just looks towards her father and she's got the tears on her face. It's uh They really do so so much in so many small ways to make these characters and these worlds seem um seems so real. Anyway, Stingray's now heading home. Say, phones. Do you hear something? Yeah. Sounds like something banging on the hull. It is, Skipper. Look. It's Marina. I knew it. Phones, open the... Somehow, Marina can yes, swim sir, faster than Stingray can move. Um, again, plot convenience. Maybe she's holding on to something with her foot. I don't know. She was holding the plant with one hand and waving with the other. But what about her father? Surely he could be in danger from Titan. How could she desert him? Maybe she figures she can best fight her father's enemy with us. Yeah, and maybe she's still working for Titan and come back to spy on us. And this is another thing I like in this episode, Atlanta's skepticism. Are you giving this to me, Marina? Everyone else is like, hey, she's a cool new friend. Isn't that a sweet thing to do? How about that, Atlanta? Isn't she just well, wonderful, Atlanta? I must admit it's a nice gesture. Thanks, Marina. Whereas in this situation in real life, you would be a bit suspicious. Here's a, you know, beware Greeks bearing gifts. Well, here's this um, mm. underwater lady with a nice plant. Atlanta's going to put it on top of her piano and have a little play. I was also never quite sure if Atlanta had her own home or if she lived with her father or if she sometimes alternated between the two because this doesn't look like the normal Shaw household. Anyway, enough of that. The plant has kicked in. I can't breathe. Somehow it knows that this is the perfect time to... Uh, I feel hot in here. To, ...to kick in and... Uh, and then maybe it was the piano playing set it off. It didn't certainly didn't go off in um in Aphany's palace. It's not like this. I can't figure this. Still no reply. Maybe she's not home. Maybe she doesn't want to see me. Oh, it couldn't be that. Everyone wants to see me. Atlanta! Oh, that's it. And here we go, the most dramatic scene of a puppet trying to break down a door. Possibly in television history. Two thumps. Yeah, this sequence isn't quite as dramatic as the um, the terrorfish attack earlier, but the music is trying to make you think it is. There we go, Troy's in. <coughs> There's no air in here. The air was consumed by that plant. There's no doubt about it. Well, it looks that way. How are you doing now, Atlanta? Yeah, but rather than rush the plant off to the lab to do some tests, they've just put the cover back on and left it on the table. It'd be pretty bad to do this to me. Well, you sure could have fooled me. She looks so sweet. Now, wait a minute. We can't be certain... Yeah, there's, there speaks the voice of a man who's clearly fallen for a lot of um, a lot of wrong women over the years. I know you think I'm crazy, but I believe Marina's innocent. Fine words, Captain, but you'll have to prove it. I'll prove it, even if I have to risk her life to prove it. Oh, now, that's the kind of friend you want, really, isn't it? I believe in Marina. He's, he's so willing to stand by you that he'll throw you into mortal danger. 
because he believes in you. Anyway, um, they've, I guess, brought Marina over to Atlanta's house now. I'm not quite sure how they explained this to her, but they've thrown her in with the, into an empty room and the plant just to see what she'll do. And she's more interested in the piano. And again, wonderful puppetry of just her reaction to this strange noise. And she's she takes a moment to think about it, and then she she sits down to play. Again, it's this is lovely character stuff. A lovely way to give this this puppet a character that she just she doesn't have without a voice artist, and yet she has got a character, and it works really well. Meanwhile, Troy phones Atlanta, and her father are spying on Marina. Now, if Marina knows the deadly effect of that plant, she'll get out of there fast. Then we'll know for sure she's a spy. This is rather cold for the Stingray crew. Give her a few more minutes. We gotta be certain. It's like sort of borderline. Stop it! Stop it! Torture almost. She's going through. She must be innocent. She. She must. Not yet, Atlanta. There's still time for her to smash the plant, if she's guilty. And smashing the plant again, that, that smashing the plant wouldn't necessarily kill it. But, yeah, Marina's struggling. The room is full of smoke, and I'm still not sure if anyone can actually see that or not. She's collapsed. Okay, Troy, get rid of that plant. Too late, Commander. He's already gone. Oh, that's it. He couldn't wait to rescue Marina. Marina. Oh, gee, I'm sorry I ever doubted you, Marina. Please forgive me. I guess we all owe you an apology, Marina. Yeah. And again, what I like from the fallout of this episode is that... Now, let's have some dinner. You're all invited, and Marina is guest of honour. Marina looks so, so hammered at this point. She looks thoroughly fed up with everybody. But I love going forward that... And I think I've said this in um, Invisible Enemy as well. Is that after this point... It'll be a pleasure. Atlanta and Marina are... The firmest of friends, and I think, quite possibly, that's probably the strongest friendship between two women that you see in the entire Jerry Anderson universe. Possibly only rivaled by Jane and Took later on, which is a really nice, um, a really nice way to to have this, you know, this love triangle dynamic of the two of them and Troy, and yet. You never get the feeling that they're in competition with each other. You never get the feeling that they don't care very deeply for each other. Um, and I, I just think it's lovely. They could have held up that, um, oh, she's a bit suspicious. I don't really like her. I don't really trust her throughout the whole series. And yet it's like, no, after this, Atlanta Marina, best buddies. Ah, Anyway, that was Plant of Doom, which I, I get the feeling I said more over that than I have done for, um, for quite a while. But there's a... There's rather a lot to say there because it it's one of those episodes that feels rather like a another big stepping stone forward to um to bigger and better things but in its own right is also um a, a, a fairly impressive story and um and technical achievement anyway I suppose it's rather an odd odd choice for your second episode to go to here's a story about a killer plant but um yeah it works pretty well um Love the title though, Plant of Doom. It's not, uh, it's not quite got the same sort of earth-shattering, um, you know, implications as Doctor Who titles that use the word doom. You know, seeds of doom, but Plant of Doom. That's pretty good. Yep, one of the uh, one of the better stingrays, I think. Mm -hmm.